mic check real quick. Hello, hello. Mic Sounds check. good. Excellent. All right, everybody. Our next talk is from Aaron and Maggie from Pivotal. If you like this talk, the open space is gonna be also in open space five, all right? It's so open space five. That's where all the fun conversation is gonna be at following this one. So take it away. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everyone for coming to our talk. This is the Kubernetes crown, awesome. Um, so we, of course, have the open space following this, and really the goal for our session is to kind of get a shared vocabulary and like a shared context that we can then all go into the open space and like have that um, more meaningful and deeper conversation with. Um, so as far as introductions, I'm Maggie. I'm Aaron. And we are um, part of the engineering team at Pivotal. Uh, specifically, what we do within our organization is we work with all of the software providers who offer um, and provide services on top of the Pivotal platform, and that includes uh, Kubernetes platform. So a lot of the partners and um, software providers that we work with are offering services on Kubernetes. Um, and with that, and with the 70 different partners that we work with, we see basically everything. Um, we see different levels of maturity, we see different tools and different packaging formats, we see different value being added, um, and what we wanna do is kinda share some of those findings and learnings out and talk a little bit about how we distill all of that information into specific categories that we can actually um, act on. So our agenda, again, about building a shared vocabulary. We're gonna start with defining what are services specifically. Service is an overloaded term and so we all wanna share the same um, dictionary when we are having a conversation in the open space. We will talk about the tools that we see and kind of uh, provide a foundation around those that we can have a discussion about. And then we will start tying it together and that will flow into the open space. So starting off, what is a service? I love um, simple questions like this because I always feel like it sounds simple but everyone kind of has a different answer. And luckily, uh, we are not the only ones that think this is a worthwhile question to ask. We uh, learned about a team at Google who went out and did a bunch of research specifically about what the terminology means, what the term service means in cloud architecture by basically asking people to label diagrams and say which one of these boxes would you call a service and then figuring out by that uh, exercise um, what it was, like what characteristic of the technology gave it that uh, definition and that name. So what they found is that it essentially boils down to two characteristics. Um, a service is considered software that is independent and opaque to the consumer that is that the person or user or consumer of that service or software uh, doesn't necessarily know the inner workings of how the software works. Uh, that could mean that it gets provided by a third party, it gets provided by a vendor. Um, it could also mean that it gets provided by a different organization uh, within your uh, company, or a different team. Um, it also, is defined as a piece of software that provides a specific value and a specific function. So a service, when you use it, you kind of know what you're gonna get. You know that it's providing a specific value, whether that's around security or providing a specific set of data. Um, so that still is a pretty broad definition of technology. A lot of things can fall in that category. And we face having to categorize um, these different services so that we can actually provide processes around them for the consumers of the platform. So one way that we've found very valuable of categorizing services is not by like the specific function they provide, but by the consumption pattern of the service. Um, how the teams surrounding that service actually interact with it, whether providing or consuming. Uh, so these are some of the consumption patterns that we talk about. So first, very simple one is the pattern of shared services. This one's very simple. This is where you would have a single instance of the service running, just one central 
instance, for example, a shared central customer database, and you would have many teams consuming that service with different entry points, different levels of access. Um, and for the sake of this diagram, we have the service running co-located, like in a similar, in the same Kubernetes cluster as the applications consuming. But as far as the consumption pattern goes, that doesn't necessarily matter. It could be running externally. Uh, the idea is just, there's just one instance and multiple uh, consuming endpoints. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the consumption pattern of bespoke services. So bespoke services is where each independent application team manages and owns the installation uh, and management of the services that their application needs, independent of each other, even if the service that they are each running is the same piece of software. And this works well for teams who are uh, have the expertise and are empowered to manage all of those things uh, themselves. But there are some organizations that we see where there's actually a specialized team that has that expertise to actually offer that service as opposed to having the teams independently manage. And so that's where we run into the pattern of on-demand services. Uh, this is where there is that specialized team with that expertise that offers a known set of service configurations that the application teams can then go out and self-service access uh, when they need. Then that central specialized team manages the lifecycle um, and is a little bit easier because the, the, that fleet of services is from a known set of configurations. So it's a little bit easier. We colloquially call those uh, Oprah services because every single team gets a service, um, which is kind of fun. Another pattern that we see very frequently is the pattern of platform add-ons. This is where um, the team or teams that are actually provisioning the clusters uh, provision certain services by default on the, on the cluster so that the teams who are then deploying software to Kubernetes um, automatically take advantage of that. So one example that we hear is um, like for every cluster that gets provisioned, the Prometheus chart and the Grafana chart just get installed by default and every application that then runs takes advantage of that. Um, these are invisible to the application teams who are deploying software to the cluster. Another very common pattern is the pattern of off-platform services. This is where maybe you're taking advantage of a uh, cloud provider's service like DynamoDB or Google Cloud Spanner. Um, and in this circumstance too, you can have your application teams either uh, owning that lifecycle and provisioning of those services through the cloud console or through the cloud APIs themselves. Um, on the other hand, there's certain cases where you can actually uh, have that experience available transparently through like the Kubernetes native experience and Kubernetes native APIs that actually go out and um, do some of these lifecycle errands for you. So that is a pretty quick run through of the different patterns. Hopefully that uh, gives kind of a shared definition to everyone and I will pass it to Aaron to talk about the different tools. All right, <coughs> thank you, Maggie. Okay, so these are um, tools for uh, configuring and deploying services on Kubernetes. Um, this is a non-exhaustive non list of 60 plus tools that you can use to do that. Um, we'd have less than 10 seconds to, for each of these to go through these, so we won't do that. Um, I'm just gonna cover at, at a high level uh, a few tools we see commonly used. Um, so if you've even tinkered with Kubernetes, you're probably familiar with kubectl. Um, and essentially this is just a chunk of YAML that uh, defines the specs of the Kubernetes objects you wanna create. Um, for very simplistic services, this may work. Um, however, uh, when you want to deploy more complex services or you want to deploy many uh, of a particular service with slight variations, this uh, uh, becomes very difficult to manage. Um, customize is now 
sort of a, uh, uh, a tool built into KubeCuddle now that allows you to apply overrides to the values of, of the YAML. So that is one way of providing variance. However, um, it, there are other uh, ways of looking at the problem. Um, the most common uh, package manager for Kubernetes is Helm. And it has a very large ecosystem. And this sort of takes the opposite perspective of you know, uh, using raw YAML on that. Like it treats a collection of API objects as a single entity. So when you're doing lifecycle operations, you're acting on all those objects, not just one. Um, and one of, the, one of the big advantages of this is it offers a common interface to uh, working with that, that set of objects that make up this service. So for instance, uh, a Helm install is, is very simple, and here's some overrided values here. So this is a templating language, so it, what you can override is set by the service author. And then if you want to view which services you have deployed, it's a, a simple command again, and this is going to give you a view of like all the services you've deployed with Helm, which differs from some other tools. Operators. Um, so Kelsey Hightower, one of the creators of Kubernetes, um, sort of is, is highlighting the fact that Kubernetes does provide some useful value um, to service authors and application authors. However, it does not solve the entire problem of uh, service management and application management. So that's where operators come into play. And operators aren't really a tool, it's a pattern um, for uh, developing a controller uh, that uh, manages your, your service. Um, so it's a custom resource definition which is essentially a schema for your particular service that extends the Kubernetes API, um, coupled with a controller that understands that particular service and can do application-specific things for it. So for instance, um, if you need to remove or add a node to a uh, cluster database, uh, a controller would be able to handle that at an application level. Um, and this is what we're seeing uh, a lot of our vendors moving to is implementing operators for their services. And so when you're listing the deployed services with a custom resource, you're specifying the kind. In this case, that's a MySQL cluster. And so you're just getting a view of the MySQL clusters, not all of the services which you've deployed. So that differs a little bit from Helm. Um, and I did write a short comic on operators to sort of uh, clarify some shared language you use with them. I hear CRD used wrong all the time. Um, sometimes there's confusion about what a controller does, so check that out. Um, <coughs> next up is service catalog and service brokers. So a service broker is uh, simply a simple set of API endpoints that allows you to provision, gain access to, and manage services. And service catalog uh, creates a marketplace for the service brokers which you register with it. Um, so this is really uh, useful if you want to consume an off-platform service that has a service broker written for it, and you want to uh, uh, make that available to your application, which is running in Kubernetes. Um, it also provides the ability for you to curate which services are offered. So you'll see here there's like some plans, they're, they're called plans, um, where you can specify like medium, large, cluster, or single node, multi-node, et cetera. And this is what it looks like listing services uh, here. And then finally, Kibosh is an open source project that Maggie and I and our team are working on, and this works in the opposite direction. So if you want to run your service on Kubernetes yet consume it off-platform, um, this is uh, one approach to that. And what this does is essentially wraps the service broker API around Helm. And that allows you to curate services um, that are available, and when you provision those with the service broker, on the back end it does a Helm install, and uh, uh, some orchestration with, with the charts. All right, so tying it all together, um, none of this is probably earth shattering for some of those that are already on their Kubernetes uh, journey, um, but we, we often think about services and how they're consumed for a few reasons. Um, one, uh, the consumption pattern. pattern. So um, you know, if you have like an individual instance um, or you want to provision those manually, then, then some of these tools are probably overkill. If you want on demand, um, then something like Kibosh or, or Service Broker uh, allow you to curate those services. Uh, Kubernetes familiarity. So there's sort of two schools of thought with Kubernetes. One is that it's a platform for uh, application developers, and the other is it's a platform for building platforms. So 
uh, depending on you know, how you view that, for instance, if you wanted to do offer on-demand services, um, if the Kubernetes familiarity is, is high, then something like uh, uh, CRDs and operators may be appropriate for that. However, if it's uh, off-platform consumption, then something like uh, Kibosh would be more appropriate. Um, looking for maturity of a service. So we see a, a range of maturity with services, um, and uh, especially with stateful services, which is a lot of what we see, we look for them having authored an operator as a sign of at least they're thinking about um, providing a more robust experience for lifecycle operations. Um, and then finally, use the tool or tools that fit your need. Um, so these aren't exclusive from each other. Uh, and one of the things, like for instance, that I hear a lot from service authors is that they start writing a Helm chart and then they realize it's not robust enough for them so they write an operator. Well, those aren't exclusive from each other. You can use, still use Helm to package that operator so that it can be installed and, and manage the operator's lifecycle itself with Helm. Um, service catalog combines brokers with Kubernetes objects and then Kibosh combines Helm charts with server brokers. So there's unlimited combinations on how you can tie in these tools together, um, but think about the usage patterns, how they're consumed, um, and who your target audience, who your developers are. And uh, that's all we have. So hopefully none of these, these terms scare you. Um, like I mentioned, it's probably not earth shattering for, for some of those out there. Um, our typical conversations are with ISVs and with enterprise customers, so that is probably a lot different from some of you in this audience, and we'd love to hear your perspective on some of these things during the conversation section. Thank you. Thanks. All right, guys, so Open Space 5 is where you